Tonight on CTV News, the Prime Minister is backing his Australian counterpart over the war against ISIS, charges laid following the deaths of two WINS workers, and a close game for the tactics. Broadcasting across Canterbury, from the CTV studio, this is First at Five. Good evening. John Key is backing Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott over his decision to send more troops to Iraq in the fight against ISIS. The Prime Minister was at Burnside High School today to make a presentation, but it was the war on ISIS that took centre stage. Here's Marcus Gibbs. A lone protester outside Burnside High School's auditorium. I'd really rather not say a lot. Science teacher Jeff Knight silently protesting against the New Zealand government's plans to send troops to Iraq. I'm opposed. How long have you been opposing the idea of the war? Come on guys, I'm not that interesting. The protester refused to comment further on the matter, as did the school's principal, Phil Hosting, who declined an interview and didn't respond to an email requesting a statement from the school. However, Jeff Knight made his position clear on a day when the Prime Minister was due to visit the school. He's against New Zealand sending troops to Iraq to train 16 Iraqi soldiers at Camp Taj near Baghdad. Later at the PM's press conference, again the attention turned to the war with news that Australia is now stepping in. Well, we welcome the news that Australia is sending 300 people to work alongside the 106 New Zealand will be sending. It's very important that uh, there's a, a critical mass to allow us to do the job properly of training uh, those Iraqi forces. This brings the total number of Australian troops based in Iraq to around 900, while New Zealand plans to send 143 soldiers. Australia um, are great partners, they know what they're doing. Uh, they too will be sending, as I understand it, force protection people, so that's an added level of support for our people, and they'd really be our preferred and best partners. The Prime Minister has brushed away rumours that a partnership of Australian and New Zealand troops would be called ANZACs. He says the Australian troops may stay longer and are likely to have a different mandate than the New Zealand soldiers. A specific mandate, and it reflects what we've always said. We have independent foreign policy, we make our our own decisions on what we think is best for New Zealand. The announcement comes after former Labour leader Phil Goff posted a statement on Facebook condemning the government's decision to send troops to Iraq, despite promising before the election not to do so. He says it was the wrong decision for the wrong reasons to send the troops. He describes the move as a high-risk deployment, which could subject soldiers to rocket and mortar attacks and road mines. He even suggests some of the trainees could turn their guns on their trainers. He says New Zealand should instead use its position on the United Nations Security Council to demand effective action to stop money, weaponry and personnel going to ISIS. He also suggests saving the $65 million the government is investing in sending soldiers to Iraq and instead spending it on saving lives and alleviating the suffering of some of the 13 million refugees in the region. Marcus Skibbs, CTV News. WorkSafe is taking the government to court and the Prime Minister says it's not the first time. The agency is accusing the Ministry of Social Development for failing to protect the deaths of two of its workers at Ashburton Winds who were killed uh, last September. Now, if WorkSafe is successful in court, it could send a new president requiring higher security in public offices. WorkSafe laid a charge against the Ministry of Social Development this week, saying it failed to take all practical steps to ensure the safety of its employees. The Ministry has already released a private report, summing up that there was little more it could have done to prevent the shootings. However, the WorkSafe investigation says otherwise. As the case is still before the courts, the Ministry isn't commenting. However, the Prime Minister had this to say on the matter today. One level, they're independent, they have the authority to do that, um, but the, certainly um, the government would have to get, and, and the Ministry of Social Development will get all of the best legal advice and determine you know, how it wants to plead the case. He says it's not the first time the government has had to take on WorkSafe in a courtroom. WorkSafe has actually taken um, legal action against the government now on four occasions that I can recall this is the fourth. If the ministry is prosecuted, it could be liable to fork out compensation payments to victims and their families, and there is no limit as to what this amount could be. There are concerns that a prosecution could also set the ball rolling for enhanced security measures at all public offices and perhaps banks, including security screens and mesh windows. 
Security officers have been stationed outside Wynn's offices since the attack. It's hoped a $50,000 bonus in the pay packets of principals will be enough to attract them to work at poorer schools. The Ministry of Education is offering the grant to those who take up work at Aranui Community College. The next principal of Aranui High School could have $50,000 more in their pay packet as part of a new government initiative to recruit for schools facing social economic difficulties. Aranui is one of five schools around New Zealand to be granted the 50k boost. It's part of the multi-million dollar Ministry of Education funding scheme to improve students' educational achievement. The criteria targets schools experiencing significant underachievement, particularly for children deemed most at risk, serious safety or well-being issues for students and or staff, and high principal turnover. The pay rate of state school principals can be determined by the size of the school role, but this new initiative will put Aranui's principal at a notably higher pay level than many. The ministry says it also intends to improve teaching quality to match, but has not given any more information on how this will be achieved. Well, coming up next here on CDV News, we return to Burnside High School. Welcome back to CDV News. It's been a hundred years since many Cantabrians went to fight in Gallipoli. And this year, or this week rather, a Remembrance Centre will open to locals young and old to learn about World War I. Jared McCulloch has the details. It may be small in size, but it's home to a big part of New Zealand's history. This museum and research centre is located beside and run by the Ranadale Veterans Care Centre in Christchurch. It showcases Canterbury's involvement throughout the Great War in the 20th century, opening alongside the 100th year anniversary of Anzac troops heading to Gallipoli. And the manager says although it looks at the history of the war, it highlights the beginnings of the care centre. The centre has been set up to honour and to uh, educate the people of Canterbury and Christchurch about um, Canterbury's involvement in World War I in particular, but also about Rannadale's establishment as a result of World War I and, and caring for those uh, soldiers and uh, nurses too who came back from World War I. The Ranadale Centre first opened in 1921 on Papa Nui Road, funded at the time by Canterbury's Red Cross. But 95 years on, many contributors have helped put this exhibit together. It's taken nine months to bring it to fruition, showing the complete history of Canterbury's contribution on a timeline, from the beginning to its last World War I resident veteran at Renadale who passed away in 1996. And Steve says the reaction to the opening of the museum has been great. Very positive um, and it's wonderful to see that Canterbury and Christchurch um, citizens and wider Canterbury have really rallied around us and I would have thought no, none else than that. I think that's very much what I expected and, and it's wonderful to see. Now the focus has moved to the future and understanding war in this day and age and Steve believes the idea of battle has changed. When soldiers went and served in World War I and World War II and even Korea, they had long periods of inactivity and boredom with intense periods of um, battle. The modern day soldier goes over and has intense periods of uh, contact with the enemy if they know who the enemy is. And um, so the stress levels are immense. He says with more people surviving in missions overseas, there's a growing need for psychological care rather than just physical injuries. However, Steve believes it's been the focus for some time, with the Defence Force working with the issue and says New Zealand needs to support the soldiers. I think one of the things that we need to understand in, as New Zealanders, if we ask uh, New Zealand servicemen and women to serve overseas, we are asking, in effect, a great deal. And if we are asking them to do that, we need to stand by them. And not just for the duration of the conflict, but for the rest of their lives. The commemorative centre was officially opened to the public on Saturday and will see a number of visitors and school students understand what happened to Cantabrians through these dark times. The next step is to display the war in the 21st century, with construction starting in the near future. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. Well, there's more evidence of progress in the CBD, and this time the focus is at CPIT. A $16 million building has been completed at the Polytech. Here's Jared McCulloch. 
These students are testing their new volleyball court ahead of the opening of this tertiary provider's new science and wellbeing facility. The $1.5 million project is just stage one of the CPIT master plan, with Te Whareoro being officially opened by Prime Minister John Key at the Madras Street campus. And Christchurch Polytech's chief executive says it's a major step forward for the institute. I think after the earthquake, CPIT spent a lot of time uh, rebuilding its student numbers and maintaining our quality educational delivery. Uh, but this new facility is really the start of a new era for us. It's a, a modern facility. Uh, it's something that the community can engage with, uh, and, and it'll uh, it'll enhance our teaching and learning. So it's the state-of-the-art learning hub incorporates students studying applied science, sport, and recreation plus work school programs. But Giles says it's more than just learning going on in this building. There's also our health centre, doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, so our students have access to health care on campus. So there's recreational facilities for students. The ball court can also be used as a, a function hall and can seat up to 800 people uh, as a function. So it'll have a lot of purposes, uh, both for our students and for the community at large. And she says since the quakes, student numbers have been positive. We lost a number of students, uh, but we did manage to rebuild fairly quickly. So our student numbers last year were actually higher than they'd ever been. So we're well and truly recovered from, from the quake in terms of student numbers. And now we're taking the opportunity to uh, grow some more, but also to improve what we do. CPIT has committed funding for three new buildings at the Madras Street campus, coming in at a price tag of $120 million. While the government has chipped in across town, putting in $19 million towards the Polytech's trade site. And although no buildings were lost shortly after the quake, Giles believes they've made the right decision to rebuild. Our buildings came through structurally, by and large, pretty well. Uh, we, we only had three buildings that what you'd say were structurally compromised. Uh, having said that, we had a lot of damage, and in some instances, rather than repair and end up with repaired old buildings, we've chosen to invest rather in new facilities. And usually a red button would call for danger, but instead it was a sign of the building marked open for learning. The Prime Minister was welcomed in to have a look around at this modern learning environment, but this is just the start, with Giles saying they're on track for the new major project known as Stage 2. We've already started on the landworks for it along Morehouse Avenue. We're building a new engineering and architectural studies building because we think that's very relevant to Christchurch this point in time. And over the next eight or so years, we'll actually either rebuild or refurbish every facility on both this campus and on the Sullivan Avenue campus. It sounds like a lot of work, but it's looking bright for education in Canterbury. Jared McCulloch, CTV News. So what would you give to charity? How far would you go? Well, Canterbury University students are giving up their beds and apparently even their own reflections. Jared McCulloch explains. Giving something up for charity. That's the challenge for around 100 Canterbury University students over the next two weeks to sacrifice something they'll take for granted every day. So the idea is it's an alternative and creative way for individuals and businesses to fundraise for local charities that they care about. It's been three months in the making, using an innovative scholarship to create the social enterprise of two weeks without. The money raised from the event will go to chosen charities including Husky Rescue, White Elephant Trust and Help for the Homeless. So everyone is doing all these crazy and like vast range of things to go without. So some teams are going two weeks with without regular walking, two weeks without beds, two weeks without hot water. Some of the other challenges include not having meat for a fortnight or not using any cutlery, but then some go a step beyond. So that means like no selfies, no looking at yourself in the mirror, no looking at yourself through a glass door or a glass window, walking past a car, you're not allowed to look at yourself. Um, it's sort of like cutting out all narcissism. But the idea is proving to be difficult. So one of the hardest things is just when you're walking past shop windows and whatnot, and you can sort of see in your peripheral vision that you've got a little bit of yourself over there yeah. and just looking out into the traffic and you walk into people can be a bit of a hazard sometimes <laughs> I suppose. And Bridget says it's proven to be so popular it's hard to keep up with all the different challenges. It's really cool, it's really good. I mean like I can't, I've, like, I've lost track of how many awesome ideas that these guys have come up with and so it's super exciting and I mean this is just, it was sort of like our first challenge that we've created and it's just to kick start things off so we're going to see where it goes. But with any event like this the question is what will they get out of it?
we also want the challenge goers to get something out of it too. So we, whether it's um, something that they push themselves with or even it could be like a, a health benefit, like two weeks without sugar or two weeks without coffee or um, two weeks without um, driving the car, that sort of thing. So we want to create a, um, a movement where people are able to come up with these cool, flexible, creative challenges while also do good. She hopes other businesses around the city will jump yeah, on board with the challenge. Ideally we want the two weeks without to sort of facilitate with businesses so businesses would be able to get involved in two weeks without and they can come up with an idea to go without and they could have it within their firm or something like that and it's a really good way to um, create healthy competition and to boost team bond. But she also says the idea could spread further. We really want to see this going nationwide so it's one of those things where um, it's just it's a, an alternative way for businesses um, to do their part in the community and so this is um, so yeah we'd like to see it nationwide and yeah I mean the sky's the limit but we're going to see how it all goes. So the countdown's on all for a good cause. Jared McCulloch CTV News. Taking no selfies how will they cope? Well, it, it may have been a bit of a disruptive start for the Prime Minister's visit to Burnside High School today, but it, he was there to mark a pretty special occasion, apparently. Marcus Gibbs explains. Prime Minister John Key back at his old school. He was visiting Burnside High School today to inspire a new generation of students by gifting his ministerial warrant. This unique certificate is gifted to all ministers once per term. It holds their authority to make ministerial decisions. This is John Key's third ministerial warrant. The other two have been given to his children. Now he wants his former high school to hold on to the third. I wanted to come and give it to Burnside High School um, so that you might give that to any you want to uh, on the basis that hopefully it will just inspire another student at Burnside High School one day to go on and become Prime Minister. The PM is New Zealand's 38th Prime Minister. He would like to see Burnside continue the tradition he has started. Uh, Burnside's a great school and very proud of the time that I've spent here. It was instrumental in uh, allowing me to uh, become Prime Minister of New Zealand. While attending Burnside, the Prime Minister won the 1978 Freeman Cup for debating and in 1979 the Senior Cup for public speaking. In his last year he shared the economic prize before moving to the University of Canterbury. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Very good school, Burnside High School. Uh, we'll still to come here on CTV News, your region's weather. Welcome back to CTV News. Well, they played their first game last night, but after a close match, Canterbury's mainland tactics lost to the Mystics. Gordon Finlater has the details. The new look mainland tactics came out with a hiss and a roar in their Trans-Tasman netball competition opener last night at Horncastle Arena. In their first game under the guidance of new coach Sue Hawkins, the home side didn't take any time to adjust to the pace, going out to an early seven-goal first-quarter advantage over an international-packed Northern Mystic side. The opening shooting combination of Mawi Kumwenda and Jemil Hazeldean showed some great combination work as the Malawi international shot at 100% early in the contest. The second quarter saw the Mystics hit their stride with Catherine Latu introduced at goal shoot, making an immediate impact as her and fellow silver fern Maria Tutair produced an improved shooting display to get their side within three goals of the tactics at half time. The game's third quarter saw the match swing in the Mystics' favour as their impressive mid-court upped the pace, forcing a string of errors out of the tactics and quickly punished them on the break. With just under 10 minutes remaining in the final quarter, the tactics came back to get on level terms, but it was the visitors that produced that extra touch of class in the dying stages, putting the match to bed as they saw off the hosts eventually, winning 59 points to 50. Three. The result may not have gone the way of the tactics, but the early signs seem to look positive for the season ahead, with Maui Kumwenda looking like she will be a force to be reckoned with in her second season with the tactics. 
New defensive recruit Demelza Fallows showed some much needed composure working the ball out from the backcourt while also making Catherine Latu work hard for position in the circle. The team now has a quick turnaround with a couple of days of training before heading south to take on the Steel on Saturday. Well, to other sports news now, hundreds of participants and spectators turned out to the Canterbury Marching Championships on Saturday. Fourteen teams competed for the top spots, with pioneers of Canterbury taking out both the senior and master's grades, and Eclipse took out the under-16 and under-12 grades. Both teams will attend the New Zealand Champs at Horncastle Arena, being held in two weeks' time. And now time for your region's weather. Let's get straight into it. Timaru, you are on 19 today. Tamuka and Geraldine, slightly warmer on 20 degrees. Ashburton, it was a mild day for you on 19. Methvin, 21, your high. Rakaia, 19 degrees. Starfield, you hit a high of 21 today. Leiston and Rolleston, a cooler day on 19 degrees. Lincoln and Christchurch, you both shared 19. Over in Akaroa now, it was a mild and cloudy day. You were sitting on 20 degrees. Further north, Kaiapoi, Rangiola and Amberley, you all shared 20 today also. Colverton, Hamner Springs and Cheviot, you all hit a high of 21 degrees. And in Kaikolda, 21 for you. Taking a look at tomorrow's weather now, Timaru, the cloud will clear and sunny periods will increase during the morning with northeasterly winds developing. Tonight's low is 13, tomorrow's high 23. Some low cloud at first for Ashburton, but becoming fine and sunny for most of your Wednesday with some northeasterly breezes. Your low tonight is 13, tomorrow's high 24 degrees. Christchurch tomorrow, there'll be some low cloud clearing in the morning, then there'll be some sunny skies with moderate northeasterly winds. Your overnight low is 13, tomorrow's high 23. Up in Kaikolda tomorrow, the cloud will clear and the sun will stream through during the morning with northeasterly winds developing. Your overnight temperature is 13, tomorrow's high though is 23 degrees. Taking a look at the other areas around the region, Tamuka and Geraldine, some cloud at first, then a fine day, 24 degrees. Methvin and Rakai, there'll be a few spots of cloud, then fine, 23 tomorrow. Starfield, Leeston, Rolleston and Lincoln. The morning will be cloudy, but the sun will appear by the afternoon. 23 for you all. Over in Akaroa now, a similar picture for you, but a slightly cooler temperature on 22. Kaipoi, Rangiola and Amberley. Cloud, then some fine weather later on. 23. Colverton, Hamner Springs and Cheviot. It's looking like a great day for you also. 24 degrees tomorrow. Looking ahead for Canterbury now, some fine and sunny weather for Thursday with moderate northeasterly winds and there'll be some warmer temperatures too. Gusty northwesterly is dying out on Friday with some brief rain at times then fine with high cloud later on in the day. Moving ahead to Saturday now, cloud expected with some rain developing and colder southwesterlies flying through. As for Sunday, they'll change, becoming fine and sunny, with southwesterlies dying out, turning to northeasterly winds later on. And it'll be mostly fine and sunny by the time Monday comes around too, with just some northeasterly winds. And that is your weather for Tuesday. And just a reminder, our news team is always keen to hear from you at home, so if you have a news story you think our newsroom needs to know about, you can always email the news team at news at ctv.co.nz and don't forget this broadcast repeats at 6.30pm and 9.30pm. But from all of us here at CTV News, have a great evening. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand On Air.